Welcome to PHI Public Health Impact. I'm Phaedra Corso. And I'm Cham Dallas. And today's episode is going to be on an essential resource used by everyone. Limited supply, but increasing demand. All right, so it can't be air because I don't think there's an increasing demand, so we must be talking about water today. Yeah, we are. And despite the fact that 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water, only 1% of that is the fresh water that we can actually use. And it's getting rare. And, you know, water is a closed system, which means that the water we have now is the water we're always going to have. And the facts we're going to look at today are going to be about the Earth's fresh water supply, limited and threatened by pollution. And so we're going to talk about water quality issues, which means that this is an important part of public health. And when we talk about water quality, we're talking about the chemical, physical, and biological characteristics of water, specifically with respect to its suitability for particular purposes. And those purposes include, you know, drinking, uh, all the uses we have at home and industry. Um, we like to play in water, for that matter. And, of course, the, for the ecosystem, because plants and animals need clean water, too. And water quality, as you know, Cham, is a huge issue here in the state of Georgia because we have Atlanta here, which is one of the largest growing metropolitan areas in the country, and they require a lot of water. So this is an important issue for us to consider. Especially recently, we've had this uh, tri-state war now going on between Georgia, Florida, and Alabama fighting over water supplies, yeah. mainly due to the drought recently. I've been following this very closely. I live on Lake Lanier and have been watching those levels go up and down over the years. So this war between the states that's going on now, Imagine what would happen if the water uh, beyond a drought situation starts becoming more scarce on an individual level. And so we should also care about water quality at the agricultural level too. So you know that agriculture is our number one industry in the state. And while our agriculture industry needs the water, they're also part of the problem because they've got runoff from their fields and it could, you know, it could compromise some of the water quality downstream. Well, you know, right now, most of us just take water for granted. They turn the tap on and here it comes. But really, clean water is what separates the developed from the developing world. Clean water, that's the key. So our guests today are Dr. Marsha Black and Dr. Aaron Lipp from the Department of Environmental Health Science here in the College of Public Health. And uh, we're really excited to talk to them today. Um, Dr. Black's going to be focusing on freshwater issues, and Dr. Lip will be focusing on coastal water issues. So our expectation by the end of the show is that we will uh, understand the gravity of the situation, really what we're in right now, and uh, maybe help all of us decide to take the necessary steps to ensure that we'll continue to have clean water. I'm here now with Dr. Marsha Black, Associate Professor in the Department of Environmental Health Science and the Assistant Dean for Undergraduate Studies at the College of Public Health. Okay, Marsha, let's start with the basics. I, I turn my tap on and there's water. Um, where does it come from? Well, the water from your tap usually comes from either surface water sources, lakes, rivers, or groundwater sources, which may be a well in your backyard or an aquifer that a public treatment works uses. So. After I've used the water, what happens to it then? Well, it goes to either a septic system in your home or it goes to a wastewater treatment plant through the sewage system where it's treated. Either system will treat it and um, then at a wastewater treatment plant, it's released to surface waters. So it comes right back to us. So basically, we're reusing the same water over and over again then, aren't we? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. So in light of this fact then that there's really no new water, how worried should we be about water pollution? We should be concerned about chemicals in our, water, in our water supply. This is a very critical public health issue. So are there any pollutants that are of particular new concern? Yes, pharmaceuticals are a type of chemical we've never, we've never thought about looking for mm -hmm. in water supplies before, but we are finding them in both wastewaters surface waters, and also in drinking waters. Mm. So how do these pharmaceuticals actually get into our water systems? We take drugs and then we excrete them. They go into the septic or the sewer system. They go to the wastewater treatment plant, but it does not, most plants are not equipped to remove all of the pharmaceuticals or any of the very complex chemicals uh, from the water stream, from the wastewater stream. So they get released right back into our surface waters. So are, are these drugs 
present in our drinking water right now? Um, a recent study showed that in 28 cities they found drugs up to 56 in some cases in cities across the U.S. In fact, of the 28 cities examined, only four did not have drugs in them. Well, wow, I bet you that is something that most people watching this episode did not know, that we have all those drugs in our drinking water. No. Um, uh, let's talk now a little bit about the animals that actually live in the water. Uh, do these levels of pharmaceutical contaminants uh, affect them? Even though these levels are very, very tiny, remember that pharmaceuticals are made to have an effect. And they're made to have an effect in a very small dose so that we can take a very small pill and get well. And so when these, when these drugs hit the environment, animals come in contact with them that live in the water constantly. They live there, they eat there, they breathe there, they're there for multiple generations. They are exposed all the time. So they, it is of concern to them. Tell us about some of the research that you're actually doing in this area. We have been working with antidepressants, Prozac and Zoloft, for a number of years now. We've tested them on a number of organisms, including an invertebrate, a small fish, and now we're working with frogs. Well, has this research yielded some interesting findings? Yes, it has. Um, in our research for, with frogs, we looked at the effects of Prozac and Zoloft over the entire early life stage of the frogs. So we exposed them as tadpoles and monitored them until they turned into small frogs. And what we found was that the frogs underwent metamorphosis sooner, sooner than they should have. And when they did, they were much, much smaller, which in the natural environment is not a good thing. Size matters. It enables you to find more prey items. It enables you to find better mates. It, en it enables you to live more robust lives. Let's talk now about something that happened right here in Athens in July 2010. Uh, this is an example of major pollutants resulting from an industrial accident. Can you give us some details on that? Yes. Um, the J&J &J Chemical Company is a plant in Athens that made janitorial chemicals. It caught on fire in July and burned to the ground. The fire department came and poured 750,000 gallons of water instead of using foam, which is what they would typically do with a chemical fire. And that water ran downhill straight into Trail Creek. It turned the creek blue, and it was blue, noticeably blue, for about two weeks. And uh, it smelled like bathroom deodorizer for months. All right, so this bright, bold blue color that was indicative of water toxicity, uh, how did you actually measure it? Well, we took water samples and we took them to the lab and we did a test with a small invertebrate organism called the water flea. And this is an organism that the EPA uses in their testing. And we found that the water, especially when the water was colored blue, it killed 100% of the organisms that we tested. So in order to really properly address this situation, so the Environmental Protection Division and the University of Georgia cooperated pretty closely on this. Yes, we did. We worked with EPD to try to find a remediation strategy that would work for Trail Creek. And what we did is we collected water samples and we, we compared exposures to those water samples with and without two treatment options. And the treatment option that worked, it removed the blue color, it also removed the toxicity, was activated charcoal. Oh, so what impact did charcoal filters actually have on this? It, it seemed to remove the chemicals that were toxic to the organisms. And what EPD did was they put charcoal filters along the length of the creek and pumped par portions of the creek water into these filters. And what we found was that the toxicity of the water was removed over time. So is everything back to normal? I mean, in cases like this, does everything really entirely go back to the way it was? Well, rarely do events like this ever allow a creek or a stream to ever go back to normal. In fact, what we're finding now is toxicity in the sediments. Okay, well, why is sediment toxicity? What, what is sediment toxicity? Why is that important? Okay, well, sediments are the, the sand and the silt and the clays that are at the bottom of the stream or a lake, and organisms live in this. So 
They live in it, they lay their eggs there, so it's a very important component of the aquatic environment. So when you have toxicity in the sediment, you are affecting a number of creatures and their lifestyles in that creek. And you may be impacting fish populations or their food populations, any number of organisms. Lastly, what can we do as individuals to protect the quality of our water? We can think about the way we dispose of our chemicals. Even household chemicals can be, can be toxic if they are disposed of improperly. We certainly don't want to pour these things down the drain. We want to make use of community programs that take these chemicals back where they're disposed of properly and responsibly. In the, in the case of pharmaceuticals, there are a number of different things you can do. You can use pharmaceutical take-back programs, which happen from time to time in, in cities. And also, you can dispose of them yourself in a responsible way. Don't put them down the toilet. Put them in a can or a uh, container that can be sealed. Add something that's noxious, like kitty litter or ground or coffee grounds to that, and uh, dispose of it in the trash. Those are great recommendations, Dr. Black. I, I hope that we can get those enacted. I'm now with Dr. Aaron Lipp, who is Associate Professor and the Graduate Coordinator for the Department of Environmental Health Science, and with Jessica Joyner, PhD student in ecology here at the University of Georgia. So we're going to go from the freshwater emphasis that we were doing with Dr. Black now to a saltwater emphasis. And uh, your work involves the investigation of pollution in coastal waters. What types of pollution are you most concerned about? Well, I'm mostly interested in microbiological pollution, so the things that make you sick when you're swimming in water. And in particular, in terms of pollution, I'm interested in things that are coming out of wastewater treatment plants or septic systems or perhaps even being dumped illegally from boats, which happens. Well, how exactly does this pollution occur? Well, it depends on the source. So you can have ocean outfalls, in which case you have treated wastewater that's uh, piped offshore, usually less than a mile, and then is released into the open water there. Um, sometimes you can have septic systems in coastal areas, which may leak directly into adjacent coastal water, or they may leak into groundwater, which ultimately finds its way into marine water. And in some cases, you can have illegal dumping of, of boats, so people that are just out and about on their, on their boats and uh, can't get to a pump out station. Mm. So, so what are the risks to humans from sewage contamination in coastal waters? There are a lot of risks. The things that I look at in particular are the things that come from infectious agents that are also found in our sewage. In many cases, these are um, intestinal bacteria, viruses, protozoa that can cause diarrhea and vomiting. But there's lots of other things that can make you sick. You can get ear infections, eye infections, skin infections, although luckily it doesn't happen all too commonly, but they're all risks associated with swimming. Well, as much as I like going to the beach, it makes me not want to go back there anytime <laughs> soon. Uh, but th seriously, how are we exposed to these risks? So we're exposed by swimming in the water. So on average, a person swimming for an hour swallows about 37 milliliters of water, which is just a few tablespoons. And in some cases, that can be enough of an infectious dose to make someone sick, especially if you're a young child or you're immunocompromised. People can also be exposed just by playing in the sand and in the wash zone. In a lot of cases, there can be a concentration of contaminants in that area. So Aaron, are there any specific threats and issues associated with pollution in tropical waters? Well, tropical waters are a unique case. We have people that are swimming and recreating in tropical waters year-round. Unlike more temperate areas where it's simply too cold in the winter, people still come to tropical waters um, to swim and dive throughout the year. So they're potentially exposed more than you would be at other beaches. And in terms of exposure, it's not just in the beaches where, you know, you walk off and play in the sand. It's also in the offshore areas. People are diving, they're snorkeling, they're exploring the reef, which is great. But one of the problems, potential problems, is that we don't really track water quality very well on the coral reef itself, at least in terms of, of human health impacts. And studies that we've done have shown that, that wastewater can actually migrate quite a far distance from those septic systems on land. They can move out about 10 kilometers and then resurface in those coral reef areas. And so in some cases, you, you can have potential human health threat from swimming offshore that may not be acknowledged. So that's something a lot of people probably don't realize is that this pollution issue is not just a near coastal phenomenon, but is getting quite a bit out into the ocean itself. That's right. When you just, when you put the wastewater into the ground, it, it goes somewhere. And unfortunately, that's one of the places it can go. Yeah. 
So what is the environmental impact of this pollution? The environmental impacts can be broad. So in addition to impacting human health, it can also impact coastal water quality. One of the main threats in extreme conditions would be eutrophication. This is where you have an excess dumping of organic matter and nutrients that can result in a proliferation of harmful algae, algae or uh, bacteria, which can deplete the oxygen in the water column and cause problems for higher organisms downstream. In other cases, you can have bacteria and viruses that actually infect organisms in the environment. So I know a lot of attention is being paid to coral reefs and the preservation of these reefs. Uh, why is that so important? Coral reefs are a critically important habitat. They are localized in tropical areas of the world, and in terms of their biodiversity or the number of species that they support, they rival the great rainforests. So they're really a critical resource that is increasingly at risk from both human impacts as well as uh, changes in global climate. Well, as an important resource, what we mean is that coral reefs protect the nearshore coastline. That's where we build our houses and we have threatened mangrove habitats. Additionally, they are an important commercial fishery. By when we go to that restaurant and see snapper on the menu, that is coming from a coral reef. And in addition to snapper, there's other animals that we will harvest either for food or now we're discovering some new drugs that help for um, anti-inflammatory or other pharmaceuticals. There's a lot of things we don't really know about the coral reef yet and we know that at least it's an important resource for us. Now, as far as I know, Erin, there's only one barrier coral reef system here in the United States. Is that right? That's right. So the Florida Keys is home to the, one of the largest barrier reef systems in the world and the only barrier reef system in the continental United States. We have other smaller reef systems that populate other tropical and subtropical areas of our country, but the reef in the Florida Keys is really something quite unique. Well, what is the status uh, of this coral reef system in particular? The Florida Keys Reef Tract, unfortunately, has really seen quite a devastating loss of coral over the last 15 years, and probably longer than that. Um, but monitoring studies that have been done since 1996 has shown a dramatic loss in coral cover. So we're seeing, seeing changes from the big charismatic coral species that people like to dive and see, and, and now we're seeing more sponges and algae instead of that. You know, Jessica, you've been working on methods to better detect contamination in reefs in the Florida Keys. Uh, can you describe a bit about the research that uh, you're doing and how it might be useful in protecting coastal waters? Well, as we talked about, that wastewater contamination is really important as to address in the coastal areas. And one organism I'm interested in are the marine sponges. You can kind of picture maybe that bath sponge you use. And these organisms grow anywhere from right along the coastline out to the coral reef and they filter all the water. So if we're gonna possibly detect a contamination event early, sponges might be a good place to look for either the bacteria or other sources of contamination. Well, tropical waters as home to coral reefs and other areas are quite unique. They're unique in how humans interact with them. So unlike beaches that are in more temperate areas, people are swimming in tropical waters year round. They're a huge tourist destination which brings in billions of dollars to the local economies. And they're also important for fisheries as Jessica mentioned before. Um, so any threat um, from contamination or otherwise is really exacerbated in these areas because of potential exposure issues as well as the unique eco ecosystem that it contains. So in addition to possible human health risks, how does wastewater contamination affect the health of the coral reefs? Well, like I was mentioning earlier, with sponges living all the way from the coastal area to the coral reef, they're not the only organism there. The corals themselves are threatened. Through wastewater contamination, we've introduced a pathogen to the iconic Elkhorn coral. This is something that provides a lot of habitat to other fish, and we're now seeing a disease from a bacterium that originated from our gut. Wow. Uh, lastly, Erin, uh, what can we do to protect our, uh, our coastal waters from pollution? Yeah, I don't want this to seem all gloom and doom. I think there are some positives out there. And one of the, I think one of the main ways we can protect this environment is by improving our wastewater treatment and disposal. And we've actually seen positive stories from this. In the Florida Keys, which has advanced wastewater treatment, the, uh, the pathogen that causes disease in, in coral that Jessica mentioned is completely removed from wastewater treatment, as are human pathogens as well. So as we see an improvement in, in our wastewater treatment um, mechanisms, I think that we'll see an improvement in water quality. And it's certainly a great uh, place to enjoy. 
Uh, well, thank you, Aaron and Jessica, for what you're doing to protect coastal water quality. One of the things we like to do here on PHI is to feature our incredible students. And with us today is Megan Vogt. Thanks so much for coming in. I uh, first want to ask you, how did you get interested in public health? Well, it was kind of interesting. I was on a study abroad in undergrad that, I, that the public health school also does to Croatia. And I was with some public health master's students, and they were talking about the work they were doing, and, and I couldn't even focus on what we were supposed to do in, in, my, in my coursework, because what they were doing was so interesting, and I knew the work they were doing was so important. So and I didn't know much about it, so I, as soon as I graduated, I started to, to do some research about the program. That's great. And so what area are you concentrating in? My, um, I'm doing my master's in health policy and management, and then I'm also doing the gerontology certificate. Oh, tell me about gerontology. That's such an exciting field. It is. It's been wonderful. Um, I started getting interested in it probably from a personal place. Um, I, I, we, my family took care of my grandmothers for oh, about a decade. One of them was living with Alzheimer's. The other one just needed some help with her activities, daily living, and uh, it was it was a wonderful experience. But it did. There were some challenges that my parents faced. They were they were kind of thrown into caregiving. Um, without any kind of training or anything like that. And I always thought that there was there must be something better we can do for that population. And as you know, the amount of caregivers is going to grow in the next five years. So I wanted to work in policy and figure out some ways to help that population. That's great. So I know one of the requirements of the MPH degree is to do an internship. Were you able to do something in gerontology? I was. I was lucky enough last summer I interned at the Athens Community Council on Aging. Mm -hmm. And most of my work was primarily in the Adult Day Health Center. But I also did work with Meals on Wheels, and I did some research for food insecurity. Oh, and great. everyone who works there is amazing, and I had an incredible opportunity. It was just perfect. It was a perfect experience. Great. So tell me about your plans for when after you graduate. Well, really, I'm very open. I would love to find a job here in Athens. Um, I'm interested in maybe administrative work in assisted living or a nursing home. Um, maybe even in the at the Council on Aging, that would be amazing. Um, in Atlanta, also has great opportunities. They also have in Georgia Council on Aging, mm -hmm. and in the AARP. I'm really open. I would love to do policy work, but I also really just want to continue working the older population. Well, that's such a good field, and we're excited to have you be a representative of our college. So good luck to you. Well, thank you so much. Let's meet another public health student, Mark Lamoureux. Thanks for joining us, Mark. Sure. Thank you for having me. So my first question for you is, you do not appear to be a traditional student coming straight from undergraduate, and I guess I'd like to know, how did you get interested in public health? Kind of tell us about your life trajectory and how you landed here. I decided to go back to school, and when I did, I was looking for something where uh, I could concentrate on doing something to help people. Um, when I visited this department, it really felt like the place to be. Okay, and tell me, what area are you concentrating in? Um, I'm, I thought I was going to start in disaster management. I will have my certificate in that, but now I'm leading towards health policy and management, and mostly in the management direction. Okay, and what, is, what does that mean in terms of the types of internships that one might do? Or, or just tell us about what you're planning to do for this summer. My internship this summer will be uh, at an organization that does um, health services for the uninsured and underinsured, and I will be specifically working with them on uh, programs uh, regarding behavioral services, um, drug and alcohol addiction, and that sort of thing. And just so that people can get a, an understanding of how one gets an internship like this, what did you have to do to get this internship? I had to search and look around and ask for some help and, and direction and seeing who was actually looking for uh, interns. And um, this organization will be, I'll be their first intern that they've taken this far. And is it here locally, or are you going to be in Atlanta? Uh, it's northeast Georgia, so all the small towns up and around northeast Georgia. Great, and so maybe it will turn into a position, a permanent position afterwards. I'm hopeful that it will, and it has those possibilities. And do you have any advice for anybody else, particularly non-traditional students who might want to come back? Yeah, my advice is that don't um, doubt yourself enough to give yourself a chance to go for it and try, and um, you'll be surprised at what you can actually do. Great advice. Thanks so much and good luck to you. Thank you. You know, Phaedra, today's show was so critical for all of us. Water quality, it affects everyone. And I realize that there's a serious balancing act going on with water. And, you know, with this closed system, we really have to be uh, smart environmental stewards. 
Yeah, the major changes in the U.S. now are going to make this even more important in the future. We have this burgeoning population growth that we're dealing with, these emerging new technologies, which will impact water quality. Yeah, so the results of those two things that you mentioned are, number one, increasing demand, and number two, unfortunately, the potential for more contamination of our water. This issue is being addressed now by lawmakers. These are really important. Uh, these are critical public health issues. Um, that could come back to haunt us later, such as mm -hmm. in September 2009 when we had that big uh, sanitary sewage overflow in Atlanta. And we know we had this really dramatic example right here in Trail Creek in Athens where it turned bright blue. And yes, uh, we learned from Dr. Marsha Black that there were some things that they did to correct the problem, but there's still lingering effects. And with Dr. Lip, we looked at the coastal waters and the critical issues of the ocean, which provides 90% of the water that goes up into the critical life cycle of water for the whole world. Well, bringing it back to human health, our cells are made up of almost 90% water, so that means if we're destroying our water supply, we're self-destructing. And the bottom line, it comes down to the water we have to conserve and preserve. I love that, conserve and preserve. So we'll see you next time on PHI, Public Health Impact.